In this lecture, we're going to go into more depth talking about bases, which we defined in the previous lecture. So remember that we have this definition. So if we have a vector space V with a subspace H and a set of vectors script B, which is just some collection of vectors B1, B2, up through BP, then we say that that set B is a basis for H if when we span those vectors we get the set capital H and that that set is linearly independent. Now two particular subspaces that we're going to want to try to find bases for are the null space and the column space of a given matrix. And we already talked a little bit about finding a spanning set for the null space in a previous lecture. So let's go through that again, but this time instead of just finding a spanning set, we're going to look to try to find a basis. So remember that what we're looking for is the set of all vectors so that a times x equals 0. And so that means we're going to set up an augmented matrix for this matrix equation and row reduce that matrix. And when we look at the equations that we get from that row reduced matrix, we see that there are three free variables, and that gives us three vectors in our spanning set. But as it turns out, that spanning set is a basis. Those three vectors span the null space. As we can see here, every vector in the null space of A looks like this, so every vector is in the span of these three vectors. But those three vectors are also linearly independent. And in fact, every time we use this process to find a spanning set for the null space, what we're going to get is actually going to be a basis. And one way to see that is that for each free variable, we're going to get one vector. And that vector is going to have a 1 in a particular position, and in that same position, the other vectors are going to have zeros. So here we have a 1, but in that same position, the other vectors have zeros. And here we have a 1, but in that same position, the other vectors have zeros. That's always going to be the case when we have our spanning set for the null space. And that means that these vectors that we get must be linearly independent. Because if we take any linear combination of all but one of those vectors, then those vectors are going to have zeros in common in one of the positions. But that linear combination would never be able to equal the remaining vector, because that vector has a 1 in that position where all the other vectors have zeros. So this process that we're using for finding a spanning set for the null space actually turns out to give us a basis. So that's pretty convenient. Now let's look at trying to find a basis for the column space of A. Let's start with using a matrix that's already in reduced echelon form. So this matrix here is in reduced echelon form. And let's try to find a basis for the column space of A. So what is the column space of A? Well, it's the span of all of the columns of A. So if I give these names, I'm going to call this one A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. The column space of A is all of the vectors that we can get by taking linear combinations of the columns of A. And that means that we have a spanning set. This set, with all the A's in it, spans the column space of A, but is it a basis? And the answer is that sometimes all of the columns of A will be a basis if those columns are linearly independent. But if the columns are not linearly independent, then we can use the spanning set theorem, which we learned about in the previous lecture, to eliminate the unnecessary vectors. In this case, column 2 is 4 times column 1, and column 4 is 2 times column 1 minus column 3. And that means that we can eliminate column 2 and column 4 from our spanning set, and the remaining vectors are linearly independent. We can easily see that from here. And so that means that those linearly independent vectors form a basis. But now this begs the question, how would we do this for a matrix this, that isn't in reduced echelon form? This matrix was in reduced echelon form, and it was pretty easy to see the dependence relations between the columns. But what about a general matrix where it's harder to see those relationships? Well, the key idea is that when we row reduce a matrix A to its reduced echelon form, say B, the entries are going to look completely different. But the relationships between the columns are going to be the same in both matrices. And that's because the matrix equations, Ax equals 0 and Bx equals 0, have exactly the same solutions. Think about it this way. A solution to the matrix equation Ax equals 0 is a linear combination of the columns of A that equals 0. In other words, a dependence relation among the columns. And so that same vector x being a solution of bx equals 0 means that same dependence relation among the columns of b also equals the 0 vector. And remember, row reduction, the reason why we row reduce all the time, is that row reduction doesn't change the solutions of the underlying system of linear equations. And so that means, as a consequence, 
the dependence relations among the columns are the same for both matrices. So for example, let's consider this matrix A, which I've row reduced for you to its reduced echelon form B. So what we can see, if we give names to these columns, is that, for example, B2 is negative 2 times B1. And from what we've said before, that means that correspondingly, A2 has to be negative 2 times A1. And we can check that by looking at the columns of A. We can also see that B4 is negative 1 times B1, plus 2 times B3. And correspondingly, A4 must also then be negative 1 times A1 plus 2 times A3. And again, we can check that using the actual columns of A. Finally, B5 is 3 times B1 minus 2 times B3. And so again, correspondingly, A5 will be 3 times A1 minus 2 times A3. So what does this get us? Well, we know that A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 is a spanning set for the column space of A. Remember that that's the definition of the column space. The column space is the span of all the columns of our matrix. But now we know that A2 is a multiple of A1. In other words, A2 depends on A1, and so by the spanning set theorem, we can throw away A2 out of our spanning set, and the remaining vectors will still span the column space of A. A4 is a linear combination of A1 and A3, so we can eliminate A4 from our spanning set, and the remaining vectors will still span the column space of A. And A5 is a linear combination of A1 and A3, so we can eliminate A5 from our set of vectors, and the remaining vectors will still span the column space of A. Now, there are no dependence relations between A1 and A3 because there are no dependence relations between B1 and B3. These two vectors, b1 and b3, are linearly independent, and so that means that the vectors a1 and a3 must also therefore be linearly independent, because if there was a dependence relation between the b vectors, there would have to be a corresponding dependence relation among the a vectors. And so that means that the basis that we're looking for is just a1 and a3. That is a basis for the column space of a. And notice that those two columns are the two pivot columns in this matrix A. Which leads us to this theorem, that the pivot columns of a matrix are the basis for the column space of A that we're looking for. Now, of course, when we're looking at a matrix, which columns are the pivot columns isn't always immediately obvious. So we may have to do some row reduction so that we can identify which columns are the pivot columns. So there's two ways to think about what a basis is. So as we've seen when we're talking about the spanning set theorem, we have to stop deleting vectors from that spanning set once those vectors become linearly independent. If we deleted any more vectors after that, then the span of the remaining vectors would be smaller than what we want. And so a basis is a spanning set that is as small as possible. So we want the fewest number of vectors we can have, but still span the space that we want. On the flip side, if we try to add vectors to a basis, we can't do that without ruining the linear independence of that set. So if we add an additional vector, that vector is already in the span of the vectors that we already have, and so that resulting set would not be linearly independent. So in that sense, a basis is as large as possible while still maintaining linear independence. So let's look at an example where we're looking at whether certain sets of vectors span R3. This set of vectors is not a basis for R3 because it's too small. These two vectors don't span R3 because we wouldn't be able to get any vectors that have a non-zero third component. The vectors are linearly independent, but because they don't span, this isn't a basis. This set of vectors is too large. These four vectors span all of R3, but the vectors are linearly dependent, so they don't form a basis because there's too many of them. And this set of vectors is just right. It has the right number of vectors to span R3 and be linearly independent, and this is a basis for R3. So again, the way to think about this is that a basis has to have enough vectors to span the space that you want, but it can't have too many vectors, otherwise those vectors will not be linearly independent. So there's a balance between spanning and linear independence that gives us something that's just right that gives us a basis.